We would now ask onto the stage Mr. Edwin van der Brug. Edwin, we found out later on, came from the same hometown as myself, Zeist. And we didn't know that from each other, which is good because it saved us a lot of mutual embarrassment, probably. Um, Edwin is a regional man manager at Van Oort, and um, he is that in, in his capacity uh, of partner in the, in the Sare Wind project. Edwin is going to talk a bit about uh, the things we've seen in offshore wind and uh, the lessons we can learn from that and hopefully a bit about uh, opportunities for the Estonian industry in, uh, in the Dutch market. So the floor is yours, Edwin. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Thijs. Can you hear me? Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, as Thijs said, I'll uh, give a short introduction on who Van Oort Offshore Wind is. And then, then I will be quite elaborate on what we've learned in the last 20 years in offshore wind. Um, because what we've learned in the last 20 years and what we more or less see as challenges ahead also says something about the opportunities there will be for Estonian uh, companies to step in offshore wind. Uh, at least to step in with the right attitude and maybe can, they can fill in some gaps and they can answer to some of the challenges we've seen in the last years. Um, Van Oort is a, well there are the screens, uh, is originally a dredging contractor. Uh, next to dredging we do infrastructure in the Netherlands. We, uh, we deliver services for the oil and gas industry and of course we do offshore wind. Within offshore wind we focus on the on the foundations, we focus on turbine insulation and cable insulation, cables and foundations. We also design and uh, fabricate and install or procure and install. And what we really like to do is, is what we call balance of plant, more or less the total picture of the offshore insulation. We do so because we have uh, dedicated vessels for it. Um, we have vessels to install foundations, we have vessels to install turbines, we have cable installation vessels, we have trenchers to bury the cables into uh, the soil, we have vessels to do the rock installation, and we're every time investing in vessels because we need to, because the market asks for larger turbines, larger foundations, uh, speeding it up, uh, deeper offshore. So what you see here is the, uh, the Boreas, the vessel we just or last year ordered and which will be here in uh, 24 uh, and which would allow us to take on board the next generation of turbines, uh, which could go up to 25 megawatts. Internally, we design uh, both for ourselves, for foundations, but also for sea fastening. Um, and one of the things we every now and then do is step into a project in a very early phase. The main reason why I'm here is also because we stepped in a project in Estonia, uh, Sarama Offshore Wind Farm, and we're a shareholder in Sare Wind Energy now for two years, which means that we, we are actively developing this project uh, with the aim to build it towards the end of the decade. At the moment, we're at a uh, um, we're finalizing the environmental impact surveys. We should uh, finalize that this year, uh, have the report ready, send it in, and hopefully end of next year we will have the first location permit in Estonia or maybe even in the Baltic countries. And then we'll see how we, we proceed with financing and building the project. That's about for Nord. Hopefully that was short enough. Now a bit more focusing on what, what happened in the last 20 years and what do we expect in the coming years? Um, first thing in offshore wind, predicting is difficult, especially when it's about the future. Uh, you know, no one has a, a crystal ball, but especially in offshore wind, uh, things are, are, are exploding every now and then, and all the expectations have been met, or 
you know, the, the actual things that happened are even larger, bigger, faster than what happened and what we expected. This, this is just a, a, a illustration showing that in 2017, we thought that the goal for 2030 would be around 80 gigawatt. Uh, and even before everything what happened this year, you see that the renewable goals in the world, and this is excluding China, seems to explode. Uh, every year, other countries go into renewables. Other countries think they, they, they need to commit to the offshore wind sector. They, 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 they see offshore wind as an opportunity to, to get further. Uh, so at the moment, there is a, a goal of around 190 gigawatt of offshore wind in 2030. Just to compare, we're at the moment around 28, 30 gigawatts. And that's what we did more or less in the last 20 years. So in the upcoming eight years, there is a goal to do eight times as much, uh, sorry, six times as much as we've done so far, uh, which you could ask if that's a reliable goal, but maybe it's a goal which we'll only achieve in 2032, but still it's, it's a huge effort. And it's typically one of the things where we every time see that we have to improve ourselves. Same is about turbines. When I started 20 years ago, we were thinking about two megawatt turbines, which was already a huge step because we were coming from one to one half megawatt. What you see is that uh, the current expectations go up to 20. Last week, um, there was an article in the Renew News, uh, let's say the renewable offshore wind newspaper, weekly newspaper saying that Siemens Gamesa will have 20 megawatt turbines at the end of this decade. Uh, we don't expect that it stops like there. Uh, so we are, the, the vessel you just saw, we, we designed it to do offshore wind turbines up to 25 megawatts. Because what we've seen in this market, that every now and then a vessel comes to the market, and at the moment it's here, three years later, it's already too small. So we hope to be on the safe side. But you see that the pace of development uh, especially the last 10 years, just did go from 5 to 10 to 15, uh, 20 at the end of the decade, and then we'll see what happens. Uh, if you have larger turbines, you also have larger foundations. Uh, we started off with 240 tons foundations. Uh, now we are thinking about monopile foundations of, with a diameter of 10 meters to 12 meters with a length of 100 to 120 meters uh, and a weight to two and a half thousand tons. Um, I assume this hole is around uh, seven, eight meters, so you can't put a monopile in this hole, uh, not even thinking about the length. Uh, and that's, of course, again, asking for special vessels, uh, a special suppliers, because not everyone can supply these type of piles or has the, the opportunity to even transport them. Um, so that's, that's about the market prediction, which only shows that things are, are <laughs> every now and then running out of hand. Things are exploding and it doesn't seem to stop. Uh, uh, yesterday I had a discussion with someone who said, well, it, it will somewhere stabilize. Yes, everyone thinks so. But we fought that for five years, we fought that for 10 years and for 15 years, and it's still going up. So that's, uh, that's the trick of offshore wind, maybe, or the challenge in offshore wind. Next to that, of course, we, we learned a lot of doing offshore wind. Uh, uh, what is the complexity of building offshore wind farms? Well, the complexity is, is in, in a few things. First of all, um, we see a lot of oil and gas firms coming to the market. Uh, and, and they are very much used to complexity. You see it in the, uh, in the lower illustration, the lower picture. You know, it's a very complex uh, structure. It's a very complex um, process of, of designing the structure, installing it, making it whatsoever. And offshore wind seems to be simple. A foundation, a pile, transition piece, turbine tower, turbine nacelle, some rotor blades, fairly easy. The trick is, the, the challenge is that you have to do it 80 times. That you have to do 80 times the monopile, 80 times the transition piece, 80 times the turbine tower, 80 times the nacelle, 
240 rotor blades and a lot of cables around and going to shore. If you have a hiccup somewhere in that installation process, you have a hiccup in everything which is coming afterwards. So that's the main trick where oil and gas is really very good in complicated um, one-offs. Offshore wind is all about doing things 80 times. And if you lose one hour somewhere and you do have that in, in the whole cycle, you lose 80 hours, you lose a month, you lose the, the workable weather season and you go into next year and you lose a lot of money. Um, and that brings me to the, to the next thing, you have to align things. Uh, and you have to align those 80 turbines with those 80 foundations, with those 80 cables, with whatever it goes. Um, and, and I think that's where, for example, we think that we are strong because we, we can narrow more or less the, uh, the schedule because it's all in our hands. And if you have different contractors, you have different buffers, you have different penalties, you know, it, it's, it's getting a very difficult structure and organization to align all these sequential uh, functions. One of the other things, what you always see, and what you go, see when you go offshore, is uh, cer certainly in the beginning, is the weather. You know, uh, 20, 10 years, 15 years ago, uh, there was a German project, and they, they came back and they had huge delays and said, you know, it was very bad out there. You know, waves and, and wind and waves and wind and it's deep and it's all wet. Yeah, Jens, please, you did go out with the wrong vessel. You know, there is not something like bad weather. If you go out with bad weather and you have bad clothes, then you have a problem. If you just go out with an umbrella, like the kid on the right, you don't have a problem, you can enjoy it. That's one of the tricks, what, what it seems to be simple, but there have been a lot of projects where people just thought, let's take a, a vessel and didn't realize that you can only use a vessel on the specific conditions and that these specific conditions are not where you want to do it. So then you have to wait until the, way the, 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 the wave goes down. Uh, there was a project in, uh, in Germany where they waited in a harbor with a vessel for almost half a year. And then in the end, he had to go out with a huge offshore uh, oil and gas vessel, otherwise they wouldn't be in time. So forget about the weather, just take good clothes. The other thing what we've learned, it's not so clear on this one, but in the beginning, we were very happy if we would be able to install a foundation or install a turbine. At the moment, we think that we can do the trick, that we can install it. So what we're much more interested in is the, the value chain, the supply chain uh, uh, in front of that. Uh, because we are now more or less pulling the monopiles, the turbines out of the factory to install them. So we know the installation trick and we're more and more getting to a kind of just-in-time procedure where you, you really like to optimize the logistic chain. And don't in, underestimate it because the logistic chain means that you have for every separate project, you have suppliers, uh, turbines come from Denmark, cables come from Finland, uh, foundations come from Rotterdam, SIF, um, transition pieces could come from Spain. You have all to collect them in one harbor, which the marshalling harbor, which could be a different harbor every time again. And then you have to go out in that sequential uh, um, uh, procedure. So that's also what we learned. Don't focus that much on the foundations anymore, but focus on the, uh, on the supply chain. And that's getting more and more important. Um, and then maybe the last one. Uh, the turbine is a kind of standard product. Uh, the foundation is always more or less site-specific. We, we, what we see in, in, certainly in the Baltic Sea, I've seen projects where you had 11 different types of soil within one project which means that you always like to have a location-specific foundation, which never works, and you always have specific risk in it, and people tend to lose a lot of money. Uh, best example here is maybe uh, the example of ourselves in, in France, going out to drill foundations. Uh, tender process did take too long. We, we did lose some time to do a pilot and do a testing, so we went out 
with the new method, with new equipment, with new drills. And in the first year, uh, you know, we used it to, to learn our lessons, but we essentially lost the first year. And last year uh, was not by coincidence the first year that Van Oort had, uh, had to show a, a loss in the 150-year history. Because if you fail in doing foundations, if you fail offshore, you know, a total offshore spread could easily be 250,000 to half a billion. So if you lose 10 days, you lose two and a half million or five million. So it's, it's going very fast in offshore wind due to the fact that everything is large and big. Um, other thing which you also have to consider is offshore wind is still the new kit on the block. We build bridges for 3000 years. We do oil and gas for 150 years. Offshore wind started in 2002, more or less, with Horns Reef. Horns Reef, a project in Denmark. There were some early projects in the 90s, but the real industrial way of building offshore wind farms only started in 2002. So we have 20 years of experience, and we're more or less 20 years running around now, trying to catch up every time with a new and larger turbine with a larger water depth going further offshore. So, so we're running all the time in a new market. And I think that's, that's crucial to, to see because if we go to Estonia, it's again something new. Uh, and we only have that 20 years. If you consider that foundation structures have a lifetime or a calculated lifetime of 25 years, you see that there's no foundation yet after 20 years that already reached his, his final lifetime. So, so there's a lot to optimize, but there's still a lot to learn because we make projects that should stand over 20 years and we didn't reach it so far. So that's, that's uh, something you could, what happens in this, this, in, in this young industry. Uh, with being new kid in the block, you also have some surprises every now and then. And the surprise is that, ah, yeah, it works. Yeah. Um, this is the, the project I told you about where we lost a lot of money. What you see on this picture is uh, the way French fishermen really celebrated that we came to their area. Well, celebrating is maybe uh, not the right word. Um, France is a kind of exotic country just south of Belgium, for the ones who doesn't know. Um, the first country where we went into an offshore project where we were protected by three marine naval vessels from France uh, and where we had uh, fishermen around us throwing smoke bombs to us, uh, flares did go in the, in the, in, into the air. Some of them even tried after we were jack upped to, to sail underneath. Luckily, no one succeeded. It's, it's, it was ridiculous. It's a kind of uh, French way of showing that they not completely agree in what we're doing. It, it's, it's again, it's one of these things. It's a new kit on the block at that time for France. Uh, uh, after a lot of years of development at once, people start building in their area, in their offshore region. Uh, and for us, of course, it was a kind of, whoa, what's happening over here? Can we go in? Can't we go in? Uh, typically a sign of a new kit on the block. And if I take the same picture, um, I also show you the other aspect of the new kit of the block. This here is a frame which we use to install the piles, the pin piles for the jackets and the drilling. Uh, so in France, we went into an area with new stakeholders, fishermen running around. We, we had a complete new piece of equipment. We started drilling, which has never been done before. So more or less the complexity, and we had to do it 63 times. So the complexity was rather high at that point in time. And that's what we see everywhere we go to now. Uh, Taiwan, the US, I'll show you this one. This one is typically for the US, we want you, but we, they don't want offshore wind. In a way, they have the, the Jones Act in, uh, in America, 
which essentially means that all the vessels you can use in the world for offshore wind, you can't use them in a way in the US. Um, the Jones Act more or less says that you cannot transport a load from an American point to another American point with non-American vessels. And if you put in a foundation, it's becoming an American point. If you put in a second foundation, it's an American point. So with our Dutch vessel, we cannot sail from one foundation to the other foundation to put in a transition piece or a turbine. It's not just not allowed. So the complexity in America is that we have feeder barges coming from harbors. We are outside and we're just picking it up for feeder barges and installing it, uh, which makes it more complex, which gives more installation risk and which in the end also makes it uh, more expensive. Of course, you can't consider to invest in an American vessel, uh, but if you would do that with an American vessel, the vessel would be three times as expensive. You're, you're also very expensive in installation in the US and you will not be able to use that vessel outside of America because it's too expensive. Um, and then about money. Um, what we've seen in the couple of, last couple of years is the prices went down. Uh, it was a, a new market. We started with 20, 25 cents per kilowatt hour. We went to, uh, to 10 cents. That was the goal for 2020. But already for 2020, we saw that the prices uh, more or less went to the gray market price. We now have subsidy-free projects. Subsidy-free projects more or less saying, gents, we can build offshore wind for a normal market price. Uh, at the same time, what we see is that this is a graph, let's say, up till early this year, so before even uh, the Ukraine war started. But even in that time, you saw already that the energy prices went up, which is, of course, a nice incentive to build renewable energy. Uh, and those two things triggered uh, developers to bid high prices for offshore wind auctions or offshore wind option fees. In the New York Byte, um, I think this one over here, uh, RWE bid 1.1 1 .1 billion for a 1.3 1, 1 gigawatt offshore wind farm. And that was just an option to, to, to build it later on. They still have to go to a kind of auction to get a, uh, a feed in tariff. In the UK, uh, EBW and British Petroleum, BP, uh, are paying at the moment 200, uh, for two projects, 460 million pounds per year. And they have to do so for the coming three to four years, just to, to give, have the option to further develop the project in the, in the 50 years ahead. And of course, they have done so with the idea that uh, electricity prices go up, Offshore wind farms get cheaper, so in the end, there's a business case. Um, there's, uh, there's, of course, uh, one thing what's happening as well. If you look at the supply chain, we had a bad year last year, but two out of the three and the two main turbine suppliers have huge losses. If I look at our competitors, um, we see that uh, some of them have huge losses. Uh, so what happened the last years, due to the complexity, um, we had the loss in, in Taiwan due to COVID and being working in Taiwan. Herema had a huge loss in Taiwan. Uh, Vestas and, and Siemens, I think, what is it over here? Siemens uh, had a loss of uh, 780 million. So, so there's too much tension in the market, complexity is too high. So what you can expect at the moment, just next to the normal in inflation, is that the prices will go up. So it, it will be nice, well, maybe not nice, it will be interesting to see how in the coming years this will evolve. Because if you pay a lot for a project based on the fact that you think it will be cheaper all the time, but you know, we, we have to make some profit somewhere and we have to take care of inflation at the moment. I'm, I'm, we'll be, we'll be, I'm, I'm very curious to see if, if some projects will just fail because they can't get the, uh, the bankability and they can't make a feasible business case. So that's, that's about the money. And then 
one of the things where Estonia maybe steps in. If you look at the goals, and if you look at what we're all going to do, um, you see that there's, there's a suppliers gap. Uh, what you see here is uh, the turbines and the foundations, installation capacity. There will not be sufficient vessels. And the same goes for supply of steel. Uh, the same goes for smaller things like a hammer. You know, we, we have a monopile, we put a hammer on top, and that hammer is also two, 300 tons, 30 meters high, and we start driving the pile down. If you look at the available hammers, we have 11 hammers in the world at the moment. Uh, and we need maybe, the main ones we need are the larger ones, maybe there are five. And we have to do all those projects. So what you see is that everything at the moment is, is a kind of, uh, has to speed up. We need more, but it's not there yet because also huge investments. Uh, two weeks ago, someone said to me that if you have a monopile and a transition piece, you put them on top of each other, you, you bolt them together. Bolt them together with bolts of 30 kilograms this high. Someone said, after 24, there's no supply of bolts anymore. They're out of stock, you know. So it could be that some of these smaller bolts uh, could jeopardize projects. And I think that's, that's if you really make a, a good analysis on what's happening over there, there you see opportunities. Because the vessels, I think they will be there. Uh, we invested in the vessel, and, and don't underestimate it, huh? the, the vessel we're investing in could be up to 400 million. Uh, so also for a company as for Nord, it's a huge investment. And luckily there are some other uh, companies looking at it as well. And then maybe the, the one which could really cause a problem is that we just don't have sufficient people. Um, we see a lot of new entries in the market. We see those, those projects, we see very simple, if you triple the amount of uh, projects, you need to triple the organizations. If British BP steps into the market, Total Energy steps into the market, they need people. Uh, BP stepped in somewhere last year, they said, well, in the coming three months, we'd like to have 100 offshore wind professionals. Uh, you know, you don't go to Central Station and just pick a few of them, you, because they're not there. So what you see is a huge pressure on, on people. You see huge pressure inside companies because there's too much to do. You see a huge pressure in between companies because they are, they are just pulling people away. Uh, and especially what we see is, is that uh, also within Van Noort, you know, you have a kind of quality stamp because you did do three offshore wind farms. And then of course you're hot in the market. Um, so you see a lot of people changing places. Um, and by changing places, you lose experience and you're more vulnerable to make mistakes. I think that's, that's typically one of the things where, where, where Estonia, where the Netherlands, where we together could maybe improve. Um, I tried to put this one in, in one sentence, but I all said. So if you look at offshore wind, you can say that offshore wind is an unpredictable growing and accelerating industry where turbines and components are getting larger all the time, which have to be installed around the globe under harsh conditions by loss-making suppliers and contractors with lack of resources, for developers that have invested large sums, anticipating on ever lower levelized costs of energy combined with higher electricity prices in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambitious world. So please go and find and do something else. You know, it's just not a nice market. On the other hand, I do this for 20 years and it's just too much fun to, do in the, to work in this industry. But it, it shows the challenges of offshore wind ahead because it's real challenges. And luckily, if there's a challenge, if there's a risk, there's always an opportunity. Uh, and that's, that's good to consider. Uh, oh yeah, and I put this one in just because it's beautiful. Uh, you know, there is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And, in our case, it's called Svanen, and it's an installation vessel. I know, sounds weird, but you know, that's how contractors are. Um, because if you look on what's happening, uh, and if I look just at Estonia and the Netherlands, um, we are developing our project over here. I think Utilitas, ACNE are working over there. 
there are a number of applications over here. So it could be anywhere between one and seven gigawatt what's going to happen and what's going to be installed in Estonia. Uh, if you look to the south, oh yeah, we have of course also Elwind project here connecting to Elwind over here. We have here an area, there an area, and we have the, uh, the area in the, in the uh, Gulf of Riga. There are a lot of opportunities to work over here, to do things in a proper way, uh, to, to learn what, what we did wrong in the last 20 years. But you also see that there are a lot of opportunities in the Netherlands. I think so far we are with two and a half gigawatt. Can't read it. Um, but we will go up to 20, 22, 21 and a half gigawatt in 2030. Uh, and we have to do so looking at all the problems, and all the challenges we had so far. So try to put it in a, in a kind of graph uh, saying, well, this is the industry problem. This is a company problem. There's a project problem. Uh, this, these are all these new kits, cycle times, aligned just in time, weather. That's a shame. People, oh, this doesn't work either. Should have checked it before. Um, and we have that, 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 that more or less market challenges. I think um, looking at the market growth in Estonia, looking at the people we need, looking at the supply chain, but also looking at maybe the higher auction prices over here. Maybe that works here and maybe that can be used to, to start an industry. There are a few ways, a few openings for Estonia. Um, first look at, at, the new, at, the, at the new kit idea. If you go to the Baltic Sea, things will be different. Um, and some of the differences are in the opportunities you have over here. Uh, yesterday was a hydrogen conference and someone said, uh, yeah, maybe we're not that good in hydrogen because we cannot base it on the, on the gray hydrogen or the oil and gas infrastructure, and especially the gas infrastructure as we have it in the Netherlands. For me, that was completely, it's the other way around. Um, what I always when here when I'm here is that you are you are very far in ICT, in IT structure, things like that. And why? Because you could start at scratch at a certain moment in time. And you could say, okay, we have nothing. What if we want to develop something completely new and, and we forget just about the rest because there is no rest. Now, that, the, that's the same for hydrogen. We have to take into account in the Netherlands gas unie, we have to take into account that every house in the Netherlands in the last 30 years was obliged to have a, a, a natural gas supply, you can stay, start from scratch. What if you start with hydrogen from scratch? What do you copy paste from what we have? And what did you newly develop? I think that's, that's a challenge. The other thing is the new kit part is we are used to build an offshore wind farm and make a connection to shore. And then we make the next offshore wind farm and we make a connection to shore. We make a third one and we make a connection to shore. Here, you can start thinking about what's important. Is it important to have a production unit from offshore wind and have a cable to shore? Or is it important to have an offshore production unit and have a cable to Sweden, Gotland and Latvia? Because then you start uh, uh, more or less giving an answer to the character of offshore wind that sometimes there's wind, sometimes there's not. You need to have a strong grid to distribute it or to get uh, energy in. Because if you have seven gigawatts over here, Estonia will again be an exporter of energy. Uh, so focus on the grid, focus on what you can do uh, to use offshore wind as an export article, focus on your connections, uh, and you can start in thinking in a different way. Uh, and these connections could be pipelines instead of cables, could be molecules instead of electrons. So that's, that's typically where I think Estonia can really take a step forward and and overtake what's happening in, uh, in our country. Um, I mean, we need people to prepare and engineer our, uh, our, our projects. You know, in this world, it's, uh, a Teams meeting is normal nowadays. 
I mean, that's what we learned the, the last couple of years. And every day there's a flight at uh, 7.35 going to the Netherlands and they unload people and they load people in at, uh, at 10 and then you're here at 1. So, you know, Europe is small. Uh, so, so I think there's an opportunity for Estonian business uh, to step in offshore wind by just providing capacity. By just having gents, we have a bunch of engineers over here. Uh, and, you know, we would gladly have 10 offshore engineers coming to Vanoord because they work with us in a year and the first half year, three months, they will be learning. And then they'll just be uh, offshore wind professionals. Um, and you could even have them here working in Tallinn, Tartu or Pernu, maybe even Kurosara. Um Supply chain. I think supply chain, I would not focus on the large components. You know, to build up a offshore wind turbine factory could easily cost you a billion. If Vestas and Siemens go from one smaller platform to a larger platform, I always hear that the investment is 500 to seven, 800 million just to, to enlarge the production facility don't think it makes sense to do to something like that. I don't think it makes sense to do a monopole factory over here because, you know, it's a one to 200 million um, investment. I do think that it's, it's good what Marketex is doing, uh, secondary steel. I do think there's an opportunity for someone to make bolts over here. Um, I do think that there are other niches where you can step in and where you can be the, the, the second tire uh, producers. And, and the, the, the need is there. So I think based on what you can do over here, you can, you can find your niche to step in in, in an offshore wind uh, uh, project. Um, the last one, not sure if that's an opportunity. Um, what you see is that uh, there's the opportunity to make money with offshore wind. In, in, in on government level, you know, uh, I assume uh, that if someone bids one billion to make a project here in uh, in Estonia, everyone would be very glad. Until three years later, because you get the electricity bill, because someone has to pay the one billion back, um, and that will not be the government, that will be you. Um, so you should be very careful on these kind of things, because if you want to have an auction on offshore wind, if you want to sell your, your projects to the market and you like to make money with it, also consider that the money that's being paid has to be paid back. But also consider that if you do an auction in this market, uh, the auctions compete with each other. So if you want to, to make an auction, if you want to, to sell your project to the market, it must be attractive. Because if it's not attractive, we go to the 20 gigawatt tenders in Germany or in, in the Netherlands, or we go to the 20 gigawatt that's coming up in Germany. Um, so, so be wise in, in developing your projects, because if you don't develop it in a good way, you lose the opportunity to have a market over here, where you could also gain an opportunity if you do it in the right way and you design your project and your product development in the right way and attract people and companies to come over here. So that's, I think, the last sheet. And of course, I end with the rainbow. Um, if you have any questions, feel free. Any, yes, we see a question from the audience. Perfect, can you get the microphone over there? Thank you. Uh, I'm an architect. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned about the uh, difficulty of building foundations. Uh, and I've seen drawings uh, of uh, offshore oil and gas platforms that are just partially fixed to the seabed. They're kind of floating. So do, do you have any experience or investigations towards using floating pods, mounting pods or foundations? Uh, no, that was the question. <laughs> um, Would it make no, sense, uh, perhaps? 
I, I come with a bit more elaborate answer. Uh, we, we will it, actually it, address this question, uh, at least partially, in the discussion panel on hydrogen. So stick but, around until no, but I, later I, this afternoon. Thais, I give, I, give uh, I give an answer. Floating foundations in offshore wind are so far I don't dare to count, but if there are 20, I would be surprised, or 25 out of the hundreds we have, or thousands maybe. So it's a very small market at the moment. What you see that floating foundations will come up, especially in countries where you don't have a fixed bottom, uh, you know, uh, Mediterranean, uh, east side Japan, west side US. Uh, I once had a beautiful proposal or request coming in around Hawaii. Uh, I was not able to go over there and check it. So it will come. If I look at the Baltic Sea, if I look at our project, if I look around Sarama, water depth, 20, 30 meters, it doesn't make sense. Because what you see is bottom fixed is up to 50, 60, 70 meters, uh, very much cheaper than floating. So in this area in the Baltic Sea, I expect 99% uh, just bottom fixed foundations. Uh, floating always seems to be or sounds, you know, if something floats, it's light. Um, but if you have 1,000 ton of turbine, you need to create 1,000 cub cubic meter of volume to keep it up. And to create 1,000 cubic meter of volume, you need a lot of steel, which is again another 1,000 tons. So you need to create another 1,000 tons. So in the end, you need maybe even more material to make a floating foundation than, a, than one bottom fixed. What is this, uh, network? Sorry? What is this, uh, Sorry, I, I, uh, microphone's coming. Just uh, drifting on the idea further. Uh, what if it's not uh, a single pod with a large foundation, but a network, a connection between yeah. these? The, the uh, windmills. Put two turbines on one foundation. Uh, 20, 200. The diameter of the turbine is uh, 250, 300 meters. So you don't like to clash them. So you need automatically a kind of distance between the turbines. Um, and then you have to make a floating foundation of maybe 200 meters, 250 meters wide. I've seen, I've seen uh, concepts about it, uh, but as I said, the, the main problem in floating at the moment is that there are 100 concepts, which essentially means if there's only one winner, you have 99 choices to do, take the wrong one. It, it's just in its early stages, so it will develop, but I doubt if it will develop over here, because, okay, we have hard soil, at Sarama we have rock, but it still be cheaper to, to do a bottom fix than, than a floating one. Yeah, just last comment. Mankind has uh, thousands of years of experience building ships, so maybe there's something to learn from there. Maybe we did. Thank you so much. May I invite um, to the stage uh, the panelists. We have yet another question, if it can be a quick one. We'll go over here. Uh, my question is about uh, necessary or need infrastructure for building and uh, maintaining uh, wind parks, I mean harbors. Uh, there are a lot of discussion how, how big or how many harbors we need to, to uh, have enough infrastructure for building and more, maybe smaller harbors in future for maintaining. Uh, what is your uh, position in this field? We can build without a harbor. <laughs> you know, if we need to, we can build without a harbor. Uh, that's, that's, um, it's easier if you have a large harbor for these large components around, but you should consider um, that, that we are a kind of traveling circus. Uh, we come in with a lot of noise, with a lot of vessels, 
uh, we disturb everyone around, but after two years we're gone. So a large harbor is very useful if you have a number of projects around, because then you can use it. Like Eemshaven in the Netherlands is the best German harbor and Bornholm is the best Polish harbor. So if you have a good harbor here in the area, which could be Poldiski, you know, it makes sense to have one because you can, can use it for a couple of years, a couple of projects. But essentially what we need is a large empty area with a lot of uh, capacity to, to, to have piles on top. Um, so it makes sense to have a harbor around. We can do without, but it's much easier with one. Um, and it makes sense to, to, to invest in it if you have a portfolio. If I look at our project in, in, in Sarma, I don't expect that someone in Sarma will make a huge harbor where you have 10 to 50 meters water depth and, and have a huge bearing capacity. But I do expect that we'll have a harbor over there where you have for each project a hole of 20 by 30, 20 by 50, 30 by 60, whatever meters with all kinds of stock for the turbines, a bit for the foundations, uh, O&M crews sitting there and a, 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 a fleet of smaller vessels that sail out on a, on a daily basis to do preventive and corrective work. So I think that's, that's where you can focus on because that will be there for 30 years. That will be there for 25 years or 30 years. So you will have 60 people, 100 people, 150 persons just working in that hall doing the O&M. I think that, that will be for Kurosara the, the challenge that will be, uh, uh, or, or the, the opportunity to do, uh, where Paldiski could be the construction harbor if there are sufficient projects in the area. Thank you. Welcome.